Uh, today, it's uh, my pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Trace Kangas. Uh, Dr. Kangas is a board certified ophthalmologist. Uh, she attended uh, medical school at the Medical College of Wisconsin, did a transitional year at the Gunderson Clinic, uh, then moved on to Atlanta, where she did her residency in ophthalmology at Emory, and then on to Miami uh, at the uh, Bascom Palmer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bascom Palmer uh, Eye Institute at the University of Miami. Uh, she kindly has accepted our uh, invitation today uh, to provide us with an update on macular degeneration and imposters. And please join me in welcoming Dr. Tracy Kangas. Thank you. Thank you. The last time I addressed uh, Grand Rounds was 1998. <laughs> at that time, I specifically remember not choosing not to talk about macular degeneration because we couldn't do anything about it. We couldn't offer our patients anything except compassion at that time. In 1995, when I left Bascom Palmer, my dad always called it Baskin Robbins, <laughs> uh, my fellowship in retinal surgery, a young man came in to uh, take the place to start his retina fellowship there, and his name was Dr. Phil Rosenfeld. And I went off to Chicago, and when we saw patients with wet macular degeneration, um, we would hold their hand, and we saw the blood in the macula, we'd show them a picture of it, and we'd know that soon they would lose the ability to read, lose the ability to drive, maybe to live in their own homes, and uh, they would lose the ability to recognize faces, which particularly bothered them. In, 19, in 2005, jump ahead 10 years, and uh, this same Dr. Phil Rosenfeld, I'll call him Dr. Phil, presented data which changed our lives. He had seen a patient in the clinic with wet macular degeneration, had blood in the macula, was losing vision, and then he followed her and he saw that her vision got better, and that never happened. And so he said, what are you on? Are you, what drugs are you taking? And she said, well, I have lung cancer. And so the, my doctor started me on this new drug called Avastin. So Dr. Phil knew that cancer, uh, the Avastin worked to treat the cancer by inhibiting the new blood vessel growth. Avastin inhibits vascular endothelial growth factor, which is um, important in spreading cancer. He also knew that wet macular degeneration got worse because new blood vessels grew in the macula. So he decided to try some experiments on lab animals and uh, using Avastin, and he saw that it actually did decrease the growth of new blood vessels in the eye. And then he studied the toxicity of it. He found that he could use 1 400th of the dose of Avastin that the cancer patients were getting by vein injected directly in the eyeball and it would not only stop the new blood vessels, but it would also improve the patient's vision or at least prevent the worsening of their vision. So since then, times have changed. After he presented his data, we started injecting uh, Avastin. I think the latest number is we inject about 3 million intravitreal injections of different drugs, not just Avastin. That was just the first one. Lucentis, ILEA, um, into the eye. And now patients can, at least if it doesn't improve their vision significantly, if we treat it early, it prevents the progression of the loss of vision. So let's talk about macular degeneration. The objectives, um, I want you to recognize the symptoms of macular disease. Just get a feeling for whether it's an urgent or a routine referral. And understand that most macular diseases need long-term follow-up. So what's the macula? It's the functional center of the retina. It's what enables us to see 2020. And the fovea is the center of the macula. The fovea is best viewed on OCT. You can see it's a tiny, this is a cross-sectional OCT, and you can see that tiny uh, pit in the middle uh, is the fovea. 
So the symptoms, the blurred central vision or blind spot, uh, patients can see metamorphopsia or wavy lines on an Amsler grid. Because the fovea is all cones, these patients may have decreased color vision. Patients with macular disease, though, generally retain peripheral vision unless there's a coexisting morbidity, unless there's a vitreous hemorrhage or a retinal detachment or something. So here's an example of blurred central vision. Um, patients often describe the inability to see the details of faces, including the face of a clock. It's an example of our normal Amsler grid on the left, which we give to patients. When they see waviness and distortion on the Amsler grid, we call that metamorphopsia. Sometimes they'll describe seeing waviness like on Venetian blinds or waviness of street poles. Um, Age-related macular degeneration is the most common disease that I see, and it's the most common cause of loss of vision in patients over 60. Diabetic macular edema, number two on the list, is the most common cause of loss of vision of patients in the working age from 25 to 55. The prevalence of age-related macular degeneration, there's 11 million Americans have macular degeneration. The number is rising as our aging population rises. It's got a global prevalence of 170 million. It's twice as common as Alzheimer's disease. And it costs our healthcare system $4.6 billion a year. Risk factors for macular degeneration include increasing age. 2% of you in the audience, if you're in the 50s, probably have some form of macular degeneration. If you're in the decade of the 60s, about 10% of you have some form of it. In the 70s, about 20%. And then by the time you get to the 80s, about 30% of people have some form of macular degeneration. Smoking is another big risk factor for macular degeneration. It triples your relative risk. So if you take those numbers and you smoke, you really have some high numbers. Um, family history, if your mom or dad or sibling has macular degeneration, then you're twice as likely to have it. Obesity and being Caucasian also increases your rate. Um, we do not, when I did my residency at uh, Grady Hospital in Atlanta, uh, in the black population, it was, the incidence was much less, partly because their, pigment, their retinal pigment epithelium has, is protective against macular degeneration. So symptoms, blurred uh, central vision as I discussed, and waviness of the lines. There are two types of macular degeneration, wet and dry. 90% of people have the dry form. The etiology of macular degeneration, um, it's a, actually a degenerative disease of the retinal pigment epithelium. The, the RPE, or retinal pigment epithelium, sits underneath the retina, and when it fails, the overlying macula fails. Although the cones are the photoreceptors which receive light, and transform it into biochemistry and neurotransmitters. Um, it's the RPE that's the supportive layer. It's the RPE that sits underneath this that really supports the photoreceptors. Um, this shows an example of the outer segment of the cones over here that sit on top of the retinal pigment epithelium and get a lot of their nutrition from the RPE. So the, you can see here the cones are in the top, this hexagonal layer of cells, the yellow layer of cells is the retinal pigment epithelium, and the choroid sits below the retinal pigment epithelium. The choroid is made of many fine blood vessels that supply nutrition and oxygen to the retina going through the RPE. The retinal pigment epithelium has many functions this is a busy slide, but it's a really busy layer of cells. Um, they do have so many of the transport functions. They absorb excess light so our fovea can center. 
Um, they recycle the, the visual cycle, the metabolites of the visual cycle. They phagocytize, and this VEGF, they keep out of the RPE. This is what uh, Avastin targets, because Avastin is an antibody to that, um, that complex. So again, dry macular degeneration is the most common form. The macula atrophies slowly, and we can see pigment changes, and drusen can accumulate. Whereas in the wet form, you can get more profound vision loss because the blood or the fluid can accumulate quickly in the macula. Most patients have dry macular degeneration, and um, there's no blood or fluid. These little yellow drusen can accumulate. These drusen are actually the uh, photoreceptors when they're recycling the cones. The RPE is, is getting um, too busy to catch up with all those metabolites. So drusen collect there just sitting right on top of the retinal pigment epithelium. That's a sign that the RPE is slowing down. Pigment changes are also noted in the dry form. And here's an example of dry atrophy of the macula. You can see that yellowish uh, pigment, depigmented areas, actually. Wet macular degeneration implies that there's blood or fluid in the macula. Sometimes a macular hemorrhage can break through into the vitreous, and then the patient really has not just blurry central vision, but blurred vision all over the place. And... Um, a patient with a large submacular hemorrhage like this would notice a pretty sudden and profound loss of vision. We diagnose and follow macular degeneration with something called ocular coherence tomography. Um, Linda, I think I remember when we ordered the first OCT, it was a long time ago. We didn't have training for OCT back in the 90s or even in the early 2000s, but since then, we don't know what we do without it. We used to depend upon fluorescein angiogram, injecting dyes in people's arms and taking pictures of the retinal vessels that way. So the OCT can help us measure the thickness of the macula and identify abnormal fluid in the macula. So the OCT is a non-invasive test. It can be done in about five minutes. The patient can put their forehead here and their chin here. And our capable technicians can get this test done and download it to us um, in about five minutes, unless there's a line for the OCT machine, which sometimes there is. They can download it right to the exam room, and we get a picture like this. So the OCT not only allows us to measure the thickness of the macula, Dr. Hamouche and the other uh, ophthalmologists in uh, my group also like to look at the thickness of the optic nerve but I'm not talking about that today. <laughs> so the macular OCT can differentiate the thickness of the individual layers of the macula. I'm sure you remember all the layers of the retina from medical school. Um, suffice to say, there's cones over here and the cell nuclei of the cones show up as a dark layer on the OCT. It's called the outer nuclear layer there. And you can see here, this is the outer nuclear layer uh, where the cones are sitting on top of the retinal pigment epithelium. This orange layer is the retinal pigment epithelium. And this choroid is sitting just below it. We could go into more detail about the OCT. There's a lot of other things that we can see, but I think you're probably already sleepy with lunch anyway, so I'll move on. So this is dry macular degeneration. Again, you can see the drusen over here. And these drusen actually show up as these lumpy bumps in the RPE. Again, drusen are metabolites that haven't quite gotten uh, um, recycled by the RPE. It's like there's a garbage strike, and the RPE are the garbage men, and they haven't been keeping up with it. So these people can sometimes see waviness also. 
This is an example, this is a fundus photo of wet macular degeneration. You can see the uh, blood over here. You can see a big cyst of fluid over here. You can see blood, dark blood under the retinal pigment epithelium. And then you can see this yellow exudate. And this is, this is what it used to look like years ago. I think this is a slide from 98, which I had scanned. And uh, when there's that much lipid accumulating, you know it's been there a while. And the prognosis for vision isn't great. So this is what that looks like on an OCT. Fluid accumulates underneath that retinal pigment epithelium, and you can actually sometimes see a break where the retinal, sorry, a break in the retinal uh, pigment epithelium where that fluid also leaks into the, into the inner part of the retina. It can be very subtle. You can have just a small amount of fluid there. But even these patients with small amounts of fluid, once you see it there, you know they've got the process has started. And even they do better, a lot better, if we start treatment with them. You can see the cells thickening from the, retinal, uh, from the uh, choroidal neovascular membrane. So here's another example of a break in the retinal pigment epithelium where the fluid has gone from under the RPE into the retina. We treat macular degeneration with intravitreal injections. There are three main drugs that we use. Avastin was the first one. Lucentis was FDA approved about a year and a half after Avastin. And ILEA uh, has been approved, FDA approved for at least five years, but it's, it's an excellent drug too. As of about two weeks ago, a new drug called brolucizumab has been FDA approved. One of the reasons we're excited about brolucizumide is it lasts longer in the eye, or at least the studies indicate that it lasts longer in the eye than even ILEA does. We inject the, into the vitreous in the infrotemporal quadrant with the 30 gauge needle. I numb the eye with lidocaine and then rinse out the lidocaine and add uh, a couple of drops of betadine and uh, inject, and most people say it's not too bad. I haven't had it done myself, though. <laughs> there is a big cost difference in these drugs. ILEA costs about $2,000 a dose. Lucentis costs about $2,000 a dose. And Avastin costs about $80 a dose. Needless to say, I generally start with Avastin. AMD is a chronic disease. Uh, wet macular degeneration patients need to be monitored and may need injections every six to eight weeks, every two months maybe. Dry macular degeneration patients need to be seen about every six months because they could be transforming into the wet form. If you have developed wet form in one eye, your risk of getting it the wet form in the other eye uh, jumps to about 25 or 30 percent. We recommend both types of patients take uh, AREDS 2 vitamins. AREDS stands for Age-Related Eye Disease Study. The first study came out in 2001 and found that patients that just took these antioxidant vitamins decreased the progression of dry macular degeneration by 25 percent. AREDS 2 study came out in 2013 and what they did is they took out the vitamin A from the AREDS-1 and they added lutein and zeaxanthin, which are pigments that are in the macula that we actually lose in that RPE layer as we age. So dry macular degeneration is slow in onset. It's a routine referral with follow-up every six months. Wet macular degeneration is more of an urgent re referral within days. We usually don't have access to the OCT on the weekends, um, but usually within, by the next Monday, we see patients with wet macular degeneration if they've had a bleed. And we follow them up every one to two months until their vision is stabilized. Some of these people need long-term treatment. Some folks I've gotten to know really well because I've seen them 
every two months for five years or 10 years in some cases. They both, the dry and the wet, have central uh, vision loss. Um, I'm gonna switch gears on you now. I'm gonna talk about the second most common disease that I see, and that's diabetic macular edema. Hyperglycemia causes the retinal vessels to leak. Fluid accumulates in the macula. This fluid accumulates in the inner retina where the retinal blood vessels are because here it's the retinal blood vessels that are defective. And swollen nerves don't function well. So symptoms of diabetic macular edema include blurred and decreased central vision. Colors appear washed out or faded. People describe it as seeing sort of white on white. They have low contrast. Diabetic retinopathy, uh, microaneurysms are seen in the macula. Lipid exudate leaks into the macula. Macular edema occurs. In proliferative diabetic retinopathy, new blood vessels grow on the optic nerve, and these put the, um, these put the patient at risk for vitreous hemorrhage or a retinal detachment. So we divide diabetic retinopathy into proliferative and non-proliferative. Proliferative means it's so ischemic that new blood vessels have grown. Again, our friend VEGF is active here. Uh, new blood vessels can cause a vitreous hemorrhage. Those new blood vessels can contract and pull off the retina and cause a tractional retinal detachment in a diabetic. Non-proliferative simply means all we see are some dot hemorrhages, nerve fiber layer hemorrhages, but there's no new vessels. Macular edema can be seen in either the proliferative or the non-proliferative type. So diabetic macular edema itself is usually slow in onset, and the patients notice a gradual decrease in vision, or maybe they don't notice any vision change. A vitreous hemorrhage, the patient comes in and complains of red or, or dark black floaters that suddenly came on, and they can have a pretty profound vision loss with a vitreous hemorrhage to like the hand motion level. So the vitreous hemorrhage is more of an urgent referral. This is an example of proliferative diabetic retinopathy. This is an old fluorescein angiogram, and normally the retinal blood vessels do not leak fluorescein, but here you can see the optic nerve has leaked fluorescein. So once a vitreous hemorrhage um, occurs, it creates an overall blurred view, so it's tough for the patient to see out and it's tough for me to see in. And it's tough to do laser on patients at this point because the blood absorbs the laser and you have to crank the power up on the laser and that makes it even more painful. Um, so macular edema is the most common cause of decreased vision in patients with diabetes. Again, it's the leading cause of visual disability in, in the diabetics in the working age. And the lipid from the... Uh, from their blood vessels. The cholesterol and the lipids from the blood vessels just really leak out of these leaky vessels. I, I tell the patients that the sugar is like shards of glass inside the vessel. It pokes holes in the vessels. And even if you clear this up, um, their vessels are still defective, so to speak, and they're at risk for this happening again. This is another example. The yellow is lipid exudate in the macula, in macular edema. And the lipid can actually show up as little white chunks on the OCT. So sometimes if we see a lot of lipid, we might ask somebody, say, you know, ask your primary care doctor, what's your cholesterol level? What are your triglycerides? So the parasites of the retinal capillaries maintain the integrity of the blood retinal barrier. The, the parasites, just like their name describes, they sort of sit around uh, the capillaries. They protect... Uh, the capillaries, the integrity of the uh, capillaries. They also control endothelial cell proliferation. So when your parasites are there, um, you know, when they're intact, you're less likely to get new blood vessels growing. But when they're gone, new blood vessels can grow because it doesn't have, a, it doesn't have the, the parasites. And when it leaks in the macula, the macular edema results and blurred vision ensues. So here's an example of a normal uh, OCT, normal thickness. This is a color scale on the back. 
the, this is a normal thickness scale. But when, it, when you see red and white, the white's sort of off the scale, but that, that person has macular edema. So the OCT on the left is a normal macula and the macular thickening is seen on the, on the right. So again, the normal macula on the OCT, a cross-sectional cut looks like this. In macular edema, you can see these big, big cysts of fluid in the, in the inner retina accumulating due to diabetic macular edema. So we treat diabetic macular edema with focal laser and with intravitreal injections. We usually try to use the injections to treat it and dry it up as much as we can first before we put in the focal laser because we don't want to add more laser spots than we need. This is an example of uh, mild cystic changes. This patient may have a mild decrease in vision. This is the fundus photo. This is the OCT. As their macular edema worsens, this big cyst worsens. You can see more exudate accumulate. After um, intravitreal injection, you can see resolution of the macular edema after the treatment. However, this may not last very long, especially if the patient's A1C is 12 and their blood pressure is high. So these people need constant follow-up. Summary of diabetic retinopathy, macular edema has a gradual onset with central vision affected. It's a routine referral. A vitreous hemorrhage has an abrupt onset. Um, the overall vision, not just the central vision, can be affected. And it's more of an urgent referral with, with close follow-up. And uh, depending on whether they're type 1 or uh, type 2 diabetic, uh, possible surgery. Vascular occlusions are another fairly common thing that we see uh, in the clinic. Retinal artery occlusions um, show the symptoms of a retinal artery, especially a central retinal artery occlusion, would be an acute drop in vision like a dark curtain. And you have to rule out temporal arteritis, do a sed rate and a CRP. But um, our traditional treatment of it was to do an EKG or to send them to the primary care doctors or the cardiologists and get an EKG, an echocardiogram, uh, and or carotid dopplers to look for the source of the emboli. More recent evidence uh, recommends that we refer them immediately to a stroke center for TPA. So... Um, the, the problem is these, these folks have an increased mortality and we want to prevent further end organ damage. And unfortunately, we don't have much we can do to treat the irreversible vision loss of the retinal artery occlusion. But perhaps we could save their life or prevent a stroke or an MI. This is an example of a central retinal artery occlusion. You can see the very narrowed arterioles here. Um, the cherry red spot occurs because the surrounding macula is actually so white and edematous and ischemic. Patients with a um, uh, central retinal artery occlusion have a life expectancy on the average of about five years compared to 15 years for age match controls. So it's a bad sign. Uh, sometimes patients have a cilio retinal artery uh, that's like an, an anatomical anomaly, and they preserve um, uh, some macular function in a CRAO, but that's only if, if you're lucky, 10% uh, of the population. Uh, a retinal vein occlusion is thankfully more common and more treatable than an artery occlusion. When a soft-walled floppy vein gets compressed by a hardened artery that's arteriosclerotic, that blood in the vein uh, spreads out into the tissues and particularly causes uh, macular edema. This is an example of a branch retinal vein occlusion. You can see the nerve fiber layer hemorrhage up here and a couple of cotton wool spots and macular edema here. So this is only limited to a, a small, not even a, a quadrant of the eye. The top photo shows us a picture of the macular edema in a, in a branch vein occlusion. And the bottom shows us a cross-sectional OCT picture of intraretinal edema. Even if there's a small branch vein occlusion, 
Um, we can usually find it with OCT and we can treat it either with injections or focal laser or both. This is a hemiretinal vein occlusion. You can see the top half of the retina has a vein occlusion. And this vein occlusion, vein occlusions can also get neovascularization of the disc and these new blood vessels can cause vitreous hemorrhage. Um, the OCT here shows the swelling in the macular edema. And we check blood pressure in our patients with um, a vein occlusion because higher blood pressure can cause those leaky veins to leak more. So even if you fix them and they get back to 2020, let's say they have cataract surgery or something, the vein occlusion can come back. Treatment of retinal vein occlusions looks pretty similar to that of diabetic macular edema, and it is. Uh, we generally try to treat them with injections first. ILEA is a very good drug to use for vein occlusion. And then if we can get the swelling down to a certain focal area, we can dry that area up permanently with laser. So in contrast, the artery occlusion shows an acute drop in vision, like a dark curtain. Refer urgently to a stroke center now, if possible. A vein occlusion, patient usually notes the decreased vision over days. Refer that routinely. Um, the patients may be treated with injections or laser, and the vein occlusions are a lot more common and more treatable, thankfully, than the artery occlusions. Epiretinal membranes. Epiretinal membranes are something I see about every single day, and um, probably some of you in this room have them. They, a lot of times they don't even affect vision, but we just need to differentiate them from macular degeneration sometimes. They can also cause that waviness or metamorphopsia that the macular degeneration can cause. Uh, they are a routine referral, but if it's the first time a patient has seen that waviness, you usually want to check it out and make sure, you know, find out whether it's macular degeneration or an epiretinal membrane. If an epiretinal membrane uh, got really thick and really bad, it could be surgically peeled off if it's very symptomatic. This is an example of an epiretinal membrane. You can see that it causes distortion uh, because it just puckers up the retina. Um, that's why it needs to be uh, distinguished from macular degeneration because it causes that distortion. But epiretinal membranes are, are on the surface. They're superficial. Um, they can increase, whoops, sorry. This is just another example of a, uh, of an epiretinal membrane. Isn't that sort of cool? Uh, during surgical fellowship, when you could see these pulled, they come off like a sheet. And we're not quite sure why they grow, but they um, are more common with age. They're a little more common in women than men. They're more common if you have high blood pressure, and they're more common if you've had surgery in your eye or laser. The first four diseases we discussed affecting the macula are pretty common, things we see if not every day, uh, every week, except for the artery occlusions. They're not that common. Um, these last three are some macular uh, diseases that are not that common. Central serous retinopathy is a, uh, an unusual disease that affects healthy males in the working age. Usually it's a type A personality, someone that's trying to get a lot of things done. They describe a blurred spot. And you look in there and you see this blister, this little serous detachment of the macula. The etiology, we think, is because the choroid is hyperpermeable. And because the choroid's hyperpermeable, remember, the, the RPE is busy doing all this epithelial transport. The choroid is down here. But if the choroid gets overwhelmed with fluid, um, it, it gets transferred into the macula. We think that steroids play a role in precipitating this too. So, uh, oftentimes, if this occurs in women, which it rarely does, only about 10% of the time, it's usually because they had a steroid shot, maybe in their elbow or their back or they're on prednisone. This is an example of the subretinal fluid in central serous. Um, the next photo, this shows a fluorescein angiogram of leaky dots here 
these are the leakage spots, these little focal leakage, leakage spots, and these correspond to the decreased vision that the uh, men describe in little blind spots. And you can see the subretinal fluid here in both eyes on the OCT. The good news about central serous retinopathy, uh, it, it's a routine referral because it's generally self-limited. The only thing is, it can recur. And sometimes it can recur like 30 to 40% of the time. It could recur in the other eye. Rarely, probably 1% or 2% of the time, if you have central serous in that same area as you get older, you could develop a choroidal neovascular membrane similar to macular degeneration. So we do need to follow up these folks. A macular hole is not that common. This looks like two worms talking to each other, but it's actually an OCT of a macular hole. There's no retina tissue in the middle here. Um, this can occur spontaneously. The vitreomacular, oops, go back. Um, that traction can just pull open a hole um, and that's the more common way it occurs. Occasionally, a young kid can get punched in the, in the eye, and blunt trauma can cause a macular hole. Macular holes can be treated with surgery. And the person that um, really invented and published this surgery in 1991 is Dr. Wendell, who is the brother-in-law of our own Dr. Kathleen Foster Wendell. I think that's pretty cool. Macular schesis. Schesis means splitting. Um, this is a high myope with a thin retina and macular schesis. This has a slow onset. It doesn't occur overnight, but over years. And high myopes have thinner retinas. They're at an increased risk of holes, tears, and retinal detachments. Um, they can develop schesis or splitting of the retinal layers in the macula. It can affect their vision. Um, it develops slowly, but high myopes do need annual follow-up. Our, our uh, incidence of myopia is increasing in this country, and it's thought to be due to, it's not just in this country, it's worldwide. And it's thought to be due, due to the fact that our kids are all, um, you know, over here with their video games and their phones, and they're not playing outside and looking at the horizon. So symptoms of macular disease, uh, blurred central vision, wavy lines or metamorphopsia, decreased color vision, but usually have retention of peripheral vision. Um, which referrals are most urgent? Basically, uh, those that produce the most acute vision loss are, should be the most urgently referred. Retinal artery occlusions, this is something new that we need to send them to a stroke center. Um, vitreous hemorrhage uh, can benefit from an injection, eventually laser and surgery when we can see well enough, and wet macular degeneration needs injections. We're looking for these because we can treat them with medications, laser or surgery, and uh, Macular diseases can cause changes in central vision, affect color vision, and uh, acute vision loss means prompt referral. And just don't forget, macular diseases need long-term follow-up. Any questions? <laughs> Dr. Kitchell? No? Okay. Could you say something about the foveal hemorrhages, like a Fuchs foveal hemorrhage? Um, a, Fuchs foveal, a Fuchs hemorrhage would be something that's seen in high myopes. The retina is so thin, and they can get lacquer cracks and little Fuchs spots and Fuchs hemorrhages. And actually, the myopes can get... Um, new blood vessel membrane, sort of like macular degeneration does, but the myopic membranes are usually not as active as the macular degeneration. Macular degeneration, they sort of keep coming back, they're real aggressive, whereas the myopic may sort of burn itself out. I'm curious about the association with smoking. Do we know the mechanism, and do you think uh, marijuana smoking would have the same association? 
I think marijuana smoking probably would. Of all the things that we're inhaling, I think the antioxidants or the oxidation damage to the vessels is what's occurring. Um, but it's certainly a really, it's not only the increased incidence of, of patients with macular degeneration, you know, getting, it's not only the increased in incidence of macular degeneration in the smokers, but they also don't seem to ever get a, a respite from the treatment. You know, I, I, for example, I had one patient that got shots for five years every two months. She quit smoking. We could stop the shots. Isn't that great? You know, but it's so hard to get people to stop smoking, as you all know. So, yes. Yeah, what, what happens uh, to the macula when, when a kid looks at, a, at like an eclipse of the sun? I mean, do they damage or can they damage their... You, you can get a foveal burn. You can get a foveal burn. We can even do that with our microscope lights if we're not careful. Yeah. Um, and in a young person, a lot of times they can uh, recover. Like, for example, I have patients uh, from another practice that had a, a foveal burn due to a very long surgery that needed to be done. But as I watched over the months and years, a lot of that vision recovered. Anything else? Thank you very much for your attention.